So the basic premise behind scientific journals, so you have to imagine what this is, is science as a whole and scientists as a whole are very, very skeptical about everything. The entire world, that's the basis of science, is that we doubt everything and we're critical about everything. That's the fundamental aspect of what scientists actually do, the fund fundamental assumption that that is based into science. Um, a lot of people used to call this, or Karl Popper a long time ago, who was a famous philosopher, called this uh, falsification. And really, it's just we really are skeptical about the world and how it actually works. And so it's our job to really um, be careful in terms of the knowledge that's being created. So scientific journals are based on a, a, a sort of a system of credibility and reputation where scientists submit an article to a journal and then it gets assessed and then it comes back and um, it gets accepted or rejected. The process of it is really a lot more complicated than that. So I'm gonna walk through some of these things in terms of thinking through what this actually means to be a scientist and actually publishing in scientific journals, right? So as an author, um, usually you work in a couple of, uh, with a with a, a, a set of co-authors or sometimes you work on your, uh, with one by yourself. So I'm a, I'm, I have a sole author article um, and sometimes you kind of work on it with teams and sometimes you don't. And what you do is once you have written up a paper and sort of analyzed something and written up a paper, sometimes you write what are called theory pieces, which are sort of um, descriptions of the state of the art or a new idea or something like that. And then um, sometimes you write up more empirical pieces, which is actually analyzing the world of the way that we actually see it. And then you submit it. So that usually takes anywhere from, you know, four months to to a year, probably much longer than that, um, depending on the sort of rigor of the journal and the, the, the difficulty of getting into the journal. I'll talk about that in a minute. But what you try to do is, is you write this thing up and then you submit it to a journal. And then the journal, it gets accepted or it gets um, viewed by a, 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 the journal and then it gets dedicated to an editor. Sometimes you write in a letter, you write actually a little cover letter that says, maybe it should be this editor or associate editor should actually look at this. Or maybe sometimes the journals actually divvy it out on their own. It kind of depends on the sort of journal that you're doing. And so an editor or associate editor with a couple of reviewers actually go through the paper and they think about the paper. So the editor knows who both groups are. They know who the reviewers are and they know who the actual co-authors are, but the reviewers typically don't. Um, it's it, sometimes as a reviewer, you, you might know who that person is, but you're supposed to, um, you know, step out from that. Or, you know, sometimes you kind of have a, a hint of who they are, but generally you just don't really know. It could be anybody that's that's sending these things in. And as a reviewer, it's usually two or three reviewers at a journal um, will read it and, and give some feedback on your work. And it's usually a couple of pages long. Maybe it is two pages, maybe it's three pages, maybe it's five pages long of single space critiques of your paper. And it could be anywhere, the critiques of your paper could be anywhere of, this is total crap to, um, you know, that there is minor adjustments on this line and this line and this line. Generally, when you first submit the paper, doesn't matter how good the paper is, it's gonna be, this is total crap and this is terrible. And there's so many flaws and so many mistakes with this thing. You have to redo everything, collect a bunch of data. And that's literally what it will say. Um, or often, you know, if it's a review, that is not the best. And, and there's lots of them. It'll just say, this is terrible. And they're not gonna give you any sort of um, help in terms of how to change this and might sort of provide some advice, but generally uh, they don't. So if it's really good review, it's gonna be step-by-step step in how to actually change this to sort of help what they are seeing and um, sort of see where they're going. But often it's not really that, that that's the case. You just have to sort of make sense of it as you you sort of read this. So the, the reviewers are going to go through the paper and give critiques. So two or three reviewers will send it to the editor. And so now the editor's got, you know, 10 pages, m m likely more that they have to process and think about. And then the editor will say, 
you know, I agree with this point that the reviewer says, I don't agree with this point that the reviewer says, or they try to make a theme of what the reviewers are saying, and then they send it back to you with a cover letter from the editor. And the cover letter is maybe a page, two pages from, from the, the, the editor that says all of these are the critical issues that you have to address. And when it comes back to you, it often says, this is revise and resubmit. Um, and usually the first one that you get is very like super high risk critical um, dot, dot, dot. You know, this is explosive, no good, um, high risk <laughs> review, re right, uh, uh, you know, revise and resubmit. Uh, or you get a reject. And the reject just means you have to, it's not good enough for this journal and they have to submit it someplace else. So actually one more thing I forgot to point out, sometimes before it even goes out to the reviewers, because it's based on the system of credibility and reputation, the editor will take a look at the paper and say, is this good enough? If I send it to these reviewers, these, are, these reviewers are possibly my friends or possibly colleagues. I don't wanna make them upset by sending them something that is terrible. So before I do that, I'm going to sort of give this a brief one over. And, and generally, if it doesn't sort of make that brief one over, um, then you get a desk reject, what's called a desk reject, and the editor will send you these reasons. Usually, it's there's some real face value problems that that are that you could see in the paper, um, because sometimes people will submit things that are just not ready, and or they're going going to the wrong journal. So to get a desk reject, probably I would say at a really good journal, you're probably looking at um, you know 30, 40 percent chance of getting a desk reject um, at the revise and resubmit. So this goes out to the reviewers. And um, you know the editors actually processed it and thought about what the reviewers are. Most of the time, you're probably going to get a 75% rejection rate at that moment um, at a really good journal, and then you know um, so 25% will actually get a revise and resubmit because they only have a certain amount of space. The space is arbitrary, really, in this day and age, but they still limit the amount of space that they have just to make sure, sure that there's standards in the the journal. Um, and then what they do is is they give you this revise and resubmit, and so the the co-authors and or the co-author or the 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 single author um, will have to go and actually do a heck of a lot of work. They have to revise everything. Generally, again, the first one you have to restart everything, reanalyze everything, tell it a completely different theoretical story. That's often a really big thing. You have to think about implications of what your scientific article is about. And you know, realistically, you're looking at four months to a year to revise this article. Um, to, to realistically, to do all of that work, it would be completely unrealistic to finish this within, um, you know, a couple of weeks if it was this sort of major of a revision. So most people will take probably at least four months to actually finish the revi revision, and then uh, they'll send it back. And so there is often journals will have sort of a, a limit of how long it's gonna take you. And so what they'll often, what editors will do is they'll send you the thing and they'll say it needs to revise and resubmit, but the, re, the, the extensiveness of it is just too much. So lots of, a huge number of people will actually just not submit at that moment or pull the, um, you know, pull the article at that moment and won't continue on with the project because it's just too much work. So for those who've actually, um, revise it and then they submit it, then um, then you have to go through this process again. It goes through the editor, it goes through reviewers, they, they critique it. Um, and then, you know, you, what you have to do is address what the reviewer concerns are in the first place, but also make it better and make it sort of above and beyond what they're expecting. And so hopefully you get another revise and resubmit after that with this entire process where they, you know, each reviewer will write um, three pages or so of, of their own critiques. And so those three pages will go to the editor. The editor has got to make another, um, you know, make another summary of this and send and say that these are the issues that they still see. These are the issues that are new given what you've actually done. And then you have to revise and um, you know make sense of what they're actually trying to say and process that. And so this might go, you know, the the state of the art at this moment. You might do two revisions or or three revision, revisions, um, and then it will either get accepted. So each time it's harder or it's easy, not easier, but less and less people make it through. So by the time you actually get it done, you know, in a really good journal, you're looking at 
you know, anywhere 90, 95% of the articles are going to be um, rejected at that moment. So only like 5% are ever going to get through at a really good journal. And by the time that happens, you've done a lot and it's been rigorously vetted um, in so many different ways to the best of the ability of everybody that's involved. So it's a very collaborative sort of thing where the editors are, are helping and uh, the reviewers are generally extremely skeptical, but you know, they're trying to help, but they're very generally skeptical. And, um, you know, they, they really, really tear things apart. So, you know, you, you might be thinking about sort of different aspects of this, right? So how do, how do um, scientific journals actually pick these editors, right? So generally that's based, again, where science is based on a system of credibility and reputation, and everybody's very skeptical. So the, the way that they actually pick editors is based on a system of reputation in science. So if you have a reputation for doing high quality work and you have a reputation for fairness, right? So that's a really big thing too, because they don't want um, editors that are going to reject absolutely everything because, you know, some there's there's an extent of how much you can ask of people. Sometimes, you know, in the real world, there's limitations in terms of what science actually looks like, what's the best possible available thing. You can't, even if you do the best possible science in the entire world, you do randomized controlled trials, there's still always um, limitations to what you can do. And so they need a somebody that's going to recognize that and be fair with the review process and help you out with the review process. Um, if you don't have this sort of reputation for sort of high quality work, but also the reputation for fairness, uh, you're just not going to last in the process that long. They're going to try to figure out a way to, um, you know, sort of coach you out of the scientific process and the scientific journal process. Um, and so, you know, you also might be thinking about at that moment is how do you actually, or how do scientific journals actually make money? There's, this is not intuitive, right? Um, you know, there's revenue sources that you could sort of think of like the traditional ones a little bit of advertising and stuff but a lot of times that they get um, you know revenue sources from the school libraries at the different universities or institutions actually paying to get a subscription to this journal and that's where the reputation of, of the scientific journal really plays in because it's all based on reputation of, of high quality science so you know let's say it costs a thousand dollars to get the subscription to this journal every year um, which is shared across all the different researchers at the university that's what a, a library actually does and then so they have to pay this thousand dollars every year so they have to make sure that the quality of the journal is good enough that they're going to be paying a thousand dollars and so they have to look at you know who's on the editorial board um, is this a legitimate journal? Are they doing good science? Is this something where we can actually trust the stuff that's actually being done? Um, and, and all of those kind of things. Now, this model, I think is changing and there's an evolution that's happening at this, mo at this moment where we might not see something like that. I don't know what the model is gonna be at the end of it in terms of what's gonna happen because of technology at this moment is shifting dramatically. Things are going online, um, you know, still it's really, really going online at this moment. There's new article or new journal sort of models that are popping up, all sorts of different kinds of models that are popping up just to sort of alter this. And it's unclear in what the sort of dominant model that's gonna play out at the end of it. Um, so, you know, should another question you might be thinking about, and I think it's sort of really relevant in this day and age, is should all scientific journals be trusted? So no, um, they shouldn't be trusted. However, generally it really, really varies to the extent of how good they actually are. So the easier to publish ones, then they're very, very easy to publish in. Um, there's actually a, a credibility ranking or a sort of scoring that most universities go by in terms of how credible they are. Um, there's different sort of rankings that are out there. And the easier the ones that are to, to get published in generally are not as good because it's very easy to get published in. You can get those things in. Um, some of the ones that are really not credible, um, uh, they will encourage you to, um, you know, um, pay up front. There's kind of like weird sort of 
unusual things that are going on um, with some of the, the sort of payment schemes and stuff. Um, but generally, you know, if it's really reputable, everybody's going to recognize it. All the scientists in that area recognize it as a really good journal. That's where the sort of reputation rankings come in. And they all recognize it as it's hard to get in and it's very difficult to get in. It requires a lot of work. It's very rigorous to get in. And it also requires the best available science that's in, in that we have. So generally, if they're highly regarded, that's really what it means, or top tier journals, that's what it means. Um, you know, and again, there's different revenue models and stuff like that. So I was a little hesitant about thinking about the, the sort of payment um, schemes at the beginning because they're all slightly different because some of them are really reputable and they require you to pay a little bit up front. But, um, you know, it really depends in terms of what the expectations are um, for, for the area. But however, they're highly regarded and they're rigorous and they're hard to get into, and, and you recognize the people that are on the editorial boards as really famous people that you're like, oh yeah, I know that person. They've done so and so. Um, those are the ones that are very credible, and those are the ones that um, universally they recognize to, to be rigorous and, and as trustworthy as we can at the moment. Science changes, it's always evolving, it's always getting, um, better i would say i guess you know it's evolution is kind of a weird thing but you know it's always evolving and getting into a more rigorous uh, analysis so science the science that we had in the 1970s totally different than the science we have today um, because it's so hard to actually do a lot of the science today compared to what was in the 1970s. However, that's not to say that the knowledge that we created in the 1970s is to be discounted. It just means the rigor, the expectation is just higher at this moment to do a lot of this stuff because um, we're building on the stuff from 1970s. It's getting better. That's really, at the end of the day, the science is becoming more precise. We understand this stuff a little bit more. And so it has to get a little bit better as we sort of evolve in, in, in all the different fields that are out there. So hopefully you learned a little bit about how scientific journals work. I know it's kind of complicated, but it's based on the system of credibility and reputation. And um, to recognize that we're all really skeptical about how um, scientists are extremely skeptical about how uh, what people say, what they do, and they're always looking for ways to to knock the idea that somebody else has and tear it apart um, because that's our job. That's that's what scientists actually do.